Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Alliance Bernstein. Since 2019, employees have impacted our community by giving more than 5,000 hours of volunteerism in Middle Tennessee. AllianceBernstein.com. Alliance Bernstein is not affiliated with National Public Radio. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. When I was growing up in the suburbs of Baltimore, my neighborhood was like a mini United Nations. The co-op had a large number of families who were new to the U.S. And while I made friends and played with children from South Korea, Pakistan, Jamaica, Chile, and Saudi Arabia, their parents would often be cooking meals, creating aromas that floated through the air. Some of the smells were familiar. My folks took us to many international places to eat to expose us to different foods. Some of them were new to my senses. I knew what I wanted to eat and what I smelled. If Often, if no one was grounded, we were able to share those meals together. Now, I remember parents looking on happily as their kids, with their new American friends, enjoyed a taste of their home countries. Now, first-generation Americans are holding up two cultures at once, balancing the traditions of their families and the traditions of the United States. They're working to bring the two together through the flavors of food. Now, with us today is Vivek Surti. He is a first generation American and Indian descent who is the culinary creator at Taylor, a restaurant which offers guests a simple, timeless dining experience that emulates the intimate inner dinner party. Vivek, thank you so much for being here. Welcome to This is Nashville. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. Really excited to have you. Okay, so you built Taylor. To be like walking into someone's house. Describe that experience for me. Yeah, of course. Um, So Taylor, you know, we're open Thursday through Sunday. Uh, We have two seatings a night, 530 and 8. And what I when I created Taylor, it really was the culmination of all the dining experiences that I wanted to go to. And we didn't want people to have to make decisions when they came in. Hmm. And growing up, like we always used to go two dinner parties. So it'd be my parents' friends and we'd show up and depending on which auntie's house you were going to, you know, you would get the meal that she was going to make. So sometimes that might mean she's from a different state in India that we were from. So our family's from Gujarat, but we might go to an auntie who is Marwadi or Rajasthani or Punjabi uh, or Tamil and we might end up going to their houses, but then we would get to experience the food that comes from their culture. And we never got to make decisions. We never said, oh, we want to eat mac and cheese. We never ordered off a menu Uh and said, hey, we want all these things. You just, when you went to that person's house, you got to learn a little bit more about them through the food that you had. And I feel with the food that I grew up with, it is a cuisine that not a lot of people know about. So when people think Indian food, they usually think curry. They think chicken tikka masala, tandoori chicken, dishes like that. But those are really more British dishes than they are Indian. And the beauty of India is that it is made up of 29 different states, and each state has its own unique cuisine. And so when people ask me, where do I go get Indian food, I I tell them I don't go anywhere. I go to my mom's house. Yeah. Because to me, that's what true Indian food is. And being first-generation American where my I was born here, but my parents came from India, um, I realized that I really have an obligation to carry on the traditions and the culture that my parents came to America with. And so when we named the restaurant Taylor, it's named after all my grandparents who were tailors by profession. Mm. It gave me that point of view of, okay, if I'm calling it Taylor, I need to make the food that tailors eat. And that led me back into my mom's kitchen and my grandmother's kitchen. So that way we're sharing the dishes that we ate two, three, four, five nights a week Mm. at home. There are dishes that you can never find on any restaurant menu because they're only available through the home. But we wanted to create that experience of you being able to walk into somebody's home and for them to share their food and their culinary point of view with you. So that way then you can learn a little bit about us, but also maybe sometimes you might learn through that food experience that maybe we're not so different. Yeah. And maybe that we are actually, in fact, very, very similar. Now, when you were growing up, did your grandmother, mom, or aunties, were they the type of folks that as soon as you got into the house, they were shoving food, shoving a plate in your face? Absolutely. Absolutely. My 
uh, grandmother, you know, whenever there was a guest that came into the house, before they even sat down, she mm. had something for them to eat. Okay. And it's a culture that, you know, whether you're coming for a little bit of uh, chai in the morning or the afternoon, or you're just popping in, or you're coming for a meal, they always have to give you something, mm-hmm. right? And that's considered hospitality in India, that, you know, even if you stop by for two to three minutes just to drop something off, they're going to offer you a glass of water, a glass of tea, um, a little snack or some fruit or something. Um, and it's just a, it's a place where, you know, India and my, my family is the love is shown through food mm. and through hospitality. It sounds like my kind of neighbors. Yeah. Um, now, last week, we sent WPLN contributor David David Hooper to experience Taylor firsthand. We got a recording of how you welcomed people you were serving that night. Let's listen. All right, everybody. How's it going? Hey, welcome to Taylor. Taylor is a restaurant that we named after all of my grandparents, all of whom were tailors by profession. So here we just try to treat the place like coming into a friend's home for a dinner party. The fun part is you come in, you hang out in the living room, and then you can sit down, have a drink, get settled. And then you come through the butler's pantry and sit down here in the dining room. When it comes to food tonight, you don't have to make any decisions at all. We got snacks on the table, food will start coming, and then in between each course, we'll explain every dish. That way, if there's anything you have a question about, don't worry about it, because by the time we get there, we'll tell you everything you need to know. This menu, which is our summer menu, focuses on what we call first-generation American cuisine. I was born here in Tennessee, but my family comes from India. So we try to do a lot of the food that we grew up with in the place that we call home. The first snack that you have on your table is inspired by my grandmother. Whenever there was somebody that came into her house, before they even had a chance to sit down, she had a snack in front of them. And oftentimes it was a snack just like this one. This is called a farsa gatia. Gatia is a dough, it's made with chickpea flour, black After this, we'll go into the next dish, which is watermelon pani puri. Pani puri is one of my favorite street food dishes in India. Traditionally, it's a hollow dough that's filled with potatoes and black chickpeas, and then they add a spicy water in there. You eat it in one bite, and then you have this explosion of flavors. We make ours utilizing all the dishes. So we got a couple of vegetable dishes, some seafood, the Taylor barbecue plate, and then we'll finish up with dessert. Throughout the evening, if y'all need anything, don't hesitate to ask. Our goal is just to make sure you leave happier than when you came in. So with that, thank y'all so much for coming and joining us. We can't wait to serve y'all dinner tonight. Welcome to Taylor, everybody. You know, that sounds like a really fun experience. What have what have patrons told you about, you know, what it's like for them to sit down and have a meal at Taylor? Yeah. I think a lot of times our guests are um, always very thankful for the sharing of such a personal story. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so oftentimes people will say, thank you for letting us into your home and for allowing us to try these dishes that we wouldn't get to try, you know, otherwise. Um, I think a lot of people also comment on the uniqueness of the experience where I think, you know, so many people are... uh, focused on food as entertainment, Mm -hmm. right? Like we watch it and, you know, the rise of shows like Chef's Table and of course Anthony Bourdain and Iron Chef and things like that. People are interested and want to know more about where chefs come from and what the context of a dish is. And the way that I explain it is I, I use a very Nashville reference, which is I call it, it's like songwriter night for food, Hmm. you know? And I felt like every time that I went to a songwriter night, The fun part is you get a little bit of context into the song before you hear it. So that songwriter saying, you know, hey, I guess, you know, jokingly, 90% of the time it's like, oh, I was dating this person. And then we went through this breakup (laughs) and it made me feel all these things. and, And that's why I had to write this song. And then they sing the song. And because you've heard the context, it's so much more memorable of a song to you and so much more meaningful in the same way. You know, it's like I know sometimes at a restaurant, you might eat a dish and you can say, hey, that's one of the best things I've ever eaten. But I think there's another layer to that, which is how did they get there? And so for our dishes, we always try to say that, you know, we want to tell you the story behind the dish, not just the tradition that it came from, but also how it fits within the fabric of first generation cuisine, right? Whether it's an ingredient that grows here 
or the benefit that we have of working with some of our local farmers um, mm-hmm. that have built their businesses here, uh, that we're able to make the food um, that we grew up with in the place that we call home. Yeah. And I think people appreciate that it's a little bit different, it's a little bit more experiential, yet at the same time, it delivers on that soul-satisfying taste that I think is so indicative of the food of Nashville. That's offering comfort. That's right. To you. Now, like that evening, we just heard you brought some food to share with me. Yes. I'm sure there's a story behind it. What have you brought? So I brought you the gatia. Okay. Which is, that's the first thing um, that we had on our summer menu. Um, and in India, specifically the state of Gujarat, which is where uh, my whole family comes from, it's very famous in India for having like the best snacks. Okay. And so there is always at everybody's house, they'll have like some like steel tin containers and they'll have, you know, some might have puffed rice in them. Some will have different variations of fried chickpea dough and things like that. Uh, sometimes it might be peanuts, you know, but there's always some level of snacks, which we call farsan. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, this is called farsa gatia. So gatia, it's a dough. It's made with chickpea flour, black pepper and ajwan seed. And so ajwan seed, if you're unfamiliar, is a spice that every time I smell it, smells a little bit like fresh thyme. Okay. You know, it kind of has that little herby uh, kind of taste to it. Uh, and then it's called farsa because of the texture. And so that means soft and crunchy at the same time. So if you went to India and got farsa gatia, it would taste just like this. Just like this. Just like this. Okay, I'm about to taste yeah. this. And I'm sure you have a story, a memorable story about mm-hmm. this. Can yeah. you tell me that while I grub down? Yeah. So, you know, growing up, like we'd go to, yeah, do you like it? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when we go to like our family's house or, you know, an auntie's house, something like that, they'll start pulling out all the snacks because when we would come from America, it's like we were treated like VIPs because, you know, we were part of the family, but they didn't get to see us for, you know, a year, year, so two, a year to two sure years. That you they're know? Feeding so you. they're making sure that there's all these snacks available. You know, every time we go to somebody's house, again, that hospitality of always needing to offer something. Mm-hmm. Now, um, what I feel is also interesting about this is a lot of guests, when they first ate this, they said, OK, I've never had gatia before, but the texture of this reminds me of a cheese straw. Yes, And it has that soft and crunchy texture. Mm -hmm. So kind of that real sweet spot that we try to hit sometimes at Taylor is, okay, if you were Indian and you ate this, you understand completely what this bite is. At the same time, if you grew up here in America, what can you find relatable in this bite? Right? And it's several people throughout the course of the three months we had this menu were like, this reminds me of a cheese straw. And then even though the flavors are a little bit different, there's still something familiar about it. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's where first generation cuisine lives. It's a little bit past that idea of fusion, where you just take two cultures and mash them together, and then I feel you make a worse version of both. (laughs) Here we're trying to find, really the through line is less in the flavor, but it's in the um, recognition of something within this bite that triggers a memory Mm. that then allows you to find the connection between these two cultures. And I like what you said because our memories and experiences kind of help shape our identity. Exactly. And, you know, in the U.S., there's a lot of attention and energy put on our identities, like how we exist in the world, our culture, the food we eat play a huge part of that. As a first-generation American, tell me what your journey with identity has been like. Yeah, while I get another one of these, because this Please, is absolutely hey, the delicious. whole thing's for you. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. I'm, I'm going to share it with the team. Or yes. That would be wrong if I didn't. But this is like with the herbal flavor of it and the soft crunchiness feels like a healthy snack. It is fantastic. Yeah, I'm going to eat more. Please. And so I think with identity, a lot of first generation people struggle with this. We, you know, when I grew up, I, I was born in Manchester, Tennessee. So okay. very small town. Uh, we moved to Nashville when I was five years old. Growing up, I didn't even know English until first grade. Mm. So we grew up speaking Gujarati, um, you know, as my parents, uh, my sister, and my grandparents. We all lived together. And my grandparents always spoke to me in Gujarati because they wanted me to learn our culture. They wanted me to know the language that they spoke. And they wanted me to know about the culture that they grew up in. Uh, Of course, we also lived in America. So we're surrounded by 
you know, things that are here. But we also, you know, it's like I knew, you know, it's like I knew where everything was in the Walmart lanes because my grandmother was such a great shopper. But we'd go to India also every other year and we visit my mom's side of the family. Mm -hmm. So as we'd go there, then I would learn a little bit more about India. And what was interesting, you know, just like when I was very young in India, there were very few cars at the time. Everybody drove around on scooters, motorcycles and bikes. And I just remember that being like a, a very big difference from all the cars that I always saw here. Mm -hmm. And throughout the years, you know, it's like I went to school and my mom would give my kindergarten teacher like a list of all the words I would say in Gujarati. Okay. So like if I said dude, that meant, hey, I need milk, you know, or, and, and things like that. So, um, but then as you, as I started going to school, then I feel, I felt like I wanted to become more American. Quote unquote, mm -hmm. because then, you know, people would always look at me as the Indian kid and I just wanted to fit in. So, um, you know, it's like I feel every first generation kind of has that story where it's like you took your mom's food to school one day. Some kid made fun of you and then you went back home and you were like, hey, mom, can you just make me this peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Um, so that way I can fit in a little bit. And you have this little bit of identity crisis. And and then I remember like getting a little bit older and, and we'd go to India and in India, I would also try to fit in. But the problem was it was always so hot there. And people in India, they wear long pants and silk shirts, yeah. even when it's 100 degrees outside. And I'm like, man, I got to wear shorts and like a basketball jersey or something like that <laughs> just to get through this. So you already stick out. But, you know, here in America, I'm known as the Indian kid. In India, I'm known as the American. Mm. Right. And you kind of struggle between these two identities. And I felt I did that for you know, all, all the way through high school where, um, you know, on the weekdays, I kind of lived my American life. And then on the weekends, that's when we had like our Indian Sunday school. Uh, we do all of our like dance practices. We'd celebrate Diwali. We'd go to all these aunties houses and things like that. But I was kind of living, you know, in these two. And then when you start, you know, cooking for me, it's like, you don't necessarily want to make the food you grew up with. You kind of take it a little bit for granted, but I wanted to learn how to make pizza. I wanted to learn how to make tacos. I wanted to learn how to do barbecue. And at one point, I went back home, and my mom had made this very simple Indian meal, Gujarati meal. And when I ate it, it was like a light bulb went off. And it was one of the best meals that I've ever had. And I was like, you know what? I'm spending so much time learning how to make somebody else's food. Mm -hmm. When all I really needed to do was just look at where I came from. Mm. I'm going to pick this up after we take a short break. When we return, we'll meet a Vietnamese restaurateur who is bringing his flavor to Music City. We'll be right back. This is Nashville. Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil E. Colonna, and this is Nashville. When first-generation Americans share their cultural dishes, they act as ambassadors of their heritage, breaking down barriers and building bridges between communities. This culinary journey not only enriches their own lives, but enhances the social fabric by promoting inclusivity and mutual respect. So far, I've been talking with Vivek Surti. He is a first-generation American of Indian descent who's the culinary creator at Taylor. Joining us now is Chef Son Pham. He is a second-generation American, Asian-American, devoted to reimagining Vietnamese dishes from his childhood. He's worked in renowned kitchens throughout the Southeast. Most recently, he was a part of the chef team at the Catbird Seat, where he was heavily involved in the fermentation program. After the catbird seat, Sun went on to the pop-up incubation of Mr. Sun's, a fine Vietnamese comfort food concept. He's also collaborating with Alexis Solar and Michelle Pham on a new project, 1111, which is slated to open in the new year. Sun, thank you so much for being here. Welcome to This is Nashville. 
Thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate you being here. Okay, so I understand you used to be involved in like data, data management, engineering. Very, very interesting. But I'm curious, how did that experience in this kind of scientific, numbers-driven world influence your experience with food? Yeah, I, you know, I think there's a lot of parallels there. Uh, you know, there's attention to detail is a big one. You know, when you're a rather meticulous person and you're, and you're paying attention on the food side, you know, devil's in the details. Uh, mm -hmm. So it translated very well. Um, and, and, you know, when it comes to fermentation, there's a lot of big a lot of exact sciences. Some are not exact, but uh, they, they translate pretty well in there when you're, you know, measuring out things in, in grams and even down to, you know, below grams. <laughs> below grams. Yeah. I, I missed that part in the school. But uh, <laughs> tell me this. Give me some examples of fermentation. I think we have a base understanding of fermentation, but it goes pretty, this world is pretty deep, right? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a lot to uncover and there's a lot to study. Um, you know, and it's kind of funny when, when I, a lot of times when I bring up fermentation, some people think, you know, oh, what kind of beer are you making? Nah. You know, or kimchi. That's, that's right. Yeah. Kimchi is, and that, that is a form of fermentation as well. Um, you know, but specifically I, I like to focus on uh, a lot of things like lacto fermentation, you know, this is mm. where you take down, uh, different kinds of products. Uh, let's say for example, a carrot, you know, and, uh, you, you add a little salt and then it's called lacto fermentation because you know, the natural bacteria that's able to grow in that environment is going to create a lot of uh, lactic acid and then break down the sugars uh, in, down in, you know, to create a different type of flavor that wouldn't have been there before. You know, doing things like that with carrots, tomatoes, you kind of develop uh, the sense that you can take a really nice product from a farm and then turn into something even more delicious that you can apply to all sorts of dishes. Wow. And it's also a good way to look at uh, how you can preserve the seasons, you know, um, having tomatoes from this summer uh, and tasting them next winter. You know? mm. I think it's a really uh, strong exercise that uh, most restaurants should think about. Um, and there's also things like making miso, you know. Uh, miso is typically just taking soybeans, water, salt, and uh, koji, you know, uh, and then breaking those down, uh, their, their proteins down to amino acids. Uh, and then it becomes like this very delicious paste that like go into different soups and things like that. Um, but also a, a lot of different uh, applications from there, you know. What fruits are good for fermentation? I think any fruit is a good candidate for fermentation. You know, uh, if you're if you're looking at uh, fruits with a lot of sugars, uh, I, I think that's a that's a great candidate uh, to you know breaking those sugars into a more simple carbohydrates. Uh, that's that's one good candidate. Um, but it's okay if the fruit's also really starchy or you know even got a medium uh, amount of protein in it. Mm -hmm. now, I'm just asking because I got after I have some browning bananas in my kitchen. I'm wondering what can I add to it to, yeah. to make it pop out. But tell me this: like when your family prepared prepared meals, how much were how many fermented dishes were a part of that process? Oh, always. Uh, you know, in when I was growing up, there's there was a lot of things like fish sauce, soy sauce that were just typically base ingredients uh, in soups. You know, uh, and fish sauce is just fish and salt and a little water mm -hmm. uh, and just ferment it at a high temperature uh, to just draw out a lot of flavor, you know. Uh, we ate a lot of kimchi growing up. Uh, you know, I think in Southeast Asia, uh, different cultures have different sense of what that is. Um, and we just, we always had that, you know. Was was food, care? I'm sure preparing it with care was a big part of your family, but was it important when you all sat down to eat together? Yeah, you know, when I was a kid, uh, I, I I didn't really appreciate it until you know I was a lot older, you mm -hmm. know. But I do remember as a kid, we always sat down and had dinner. You know, uh, my dad and I would always sit down and have dinner when I was a kid, and uh, it was always just something that we had to do. You know, and sometimes you know if I was late to dinner, <laughs> yeah. you know, if, if I I didn't I didn't come to the kitchen fast enough, like he, you know, you kind of make a big deal out of it, and uh, you know that's something I really appreciate now is uh you know. We always had dinner together, and it was always like a home cooked meal, mm. and uh, just it wasn't always the same thing either, you know. So that was always really fun. Was it? I'm I'm curious about the, what the preparation process was like when you were a kid growing up. You know, was was everybody helping out? Did you kind of peek to see what was being done when it was going to be ready to serve? I was always curious. So when I got to a certain age, I was always curious about just being in the kitchen and cooking. Um, I always especially liked him when my dad made omelets. <laughs> okay. He, he cooked a lot of eggs. He was a man of, a man of eggs, you know. 
Um, but uh, yeah, I, I always wanted to be in the kitchen. I, uh, there's pictures of me when I was a kid just uh, rooting the fridge. I think I was like two. Mm -hmm. I was standing on my tippy toes, just <laughs> looking through the fridge, you know, and I did that on pretty much a daily basis. <laughs> so what took you from this world of data science, data business, to being a restaurateur and chef? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, my, uh, it was my, my dad passing away. That was a, mm -hmm. that was a big event in my life that kind of just made me realize that, uh, whatever success or financial gain I was experiencing in the corporate world, um, was not going to translate into happiness or fulfillment. And, uh, that was, it wasn't going to matter. And, mm -hmm. you know, if one, of course, like one day when, when I'm gone, you know, uh, no one's going to remember what I did in the corporate world. Uh, no one's going to remember what I do now, but I, you know, I'll remember. And that was something that, uh, that kind of struck me. It was a, a big realization, you know? And so that was when I decided to drop everything and then go deep, deep, deep into studying this passion, you know, keeping my head down and just, learning as much as I could. You brought some dishes with you. I did. I brought uh, some samples from the fermentation lab for us to try today. I'm down. I will be your test <laughs> taster. Yes. All right. Okay, what Shall do we have we? first? Uh, let's, I think it'd be a good idea to start with uh, on the lighter side and then uh, kind of go from there. We okay. Can, we can go with this. So this is what I call scallion salt. Uh, these are... Uh, Scal heirloom scallions uh, that are grown at Sugar Camp Farms in Ashland City. And uh, I took the whites and I brined them uh, in a really, really concentrated water brine. And then that went through some sort of a lacto fermentation and then also it kind of pickled itself too. Um, and then after that, I processed it to, to dehydrate it into this very fine powder. Okay. Let me try this. How long does that does the process take? This brine for about a month and a half. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Mm. And so you create this brine. What what would you season it with? I can see this working well with fish. Yeah, so uh I I recently used this on a, a tomato dish at one of my pop ups. Um I it was like a crispy tomato dish. Uh it's kind of a re-engineered dish, but uh, I seasoned that rice with the scallion salt, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and this this is from uh, earlier this summer. So we're we're basically tasting the beginning of summer uh, right now in the fall. Okay. Um, What's next? All right. So next we have uh, it's what I call lacto koji powder. So uh, koji is a a rice that's been uh, inoculated with aspergillus arising. And what I do is uh, I, I lacto ferment it uh, with a little salt and water. Uh, and I, I use the water, the koji water, for something else. And then this is the remainder uh, substrate. Mm. So I dehydrate and turn into this really delicious powder. It's got a real cheesy kind of profile to it. What does your kitchen look like? Do you have like Bunsen burners and beakers <laughs> everywhere? <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of jars, a lot of, uh, it's a big compendium, just a lot of these containers. Well, how, how does it help you as a restaurateur? It, to me, it feels like you can create and make your own spices that's, in certain ways. That's the idea. I think, uh, you know, taking flavor uh, to another level is one thing, um, but I think being able to express a season whenever you want mm. uh you know because seasons are going to change you know this these scallions uh from sugar camp were great in this one season but they're going to taste different the next year mm -hmm. you know because the soil's changing the environment's changing you know things down to the water make a huge difference um so it's good to be able to have this uh, kind of compendium of the season's flavors you know okay um so this next one's really exciting what's this one so this is uh what i call uh tomato powder. Uh, these are gorgeous uh, purple Cherokee tomatoes from RC Farms in Eagleville, Tennessee. And what I did was I lacto-fermented these uh, for about two weeks. And then what, what happens is it really breaks down all the amazing sugars in the tomatoes. Um, and then the remaining substrate, uh, after you get that tomato water out, yields this, this amazing tomato paste. Wow. So I, I just render this down dehydrated in this really nice powder. So it's just this beautiful tomato salt. Uh, and it's, it's really just tomatoes of the summer. Man, this is absolutely perfect. 
And I feel like I'm just getting these little tiny spoonfuls of all these wonderful different spices that I could think to add to dishes. Tell me this, when you, when, when you are doing this, is this an effort to preserve the traditions of your family in Vietnamese culture? Like, did, did your parents, do you add this to dishes that your parents taught you how to make? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I wouldn't say my dad ever put, uh, you know, lacto koji powder yeah. <laughs> in his foods, but, uh, you know, a lot of the foods I cook, they're, they're really to continue the traditions of when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I like to tie these, uh, my fermentation program into these foods, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so I, I really try to pay attention to keeping things as traditional as possible while also incorporating all these new things that I've learned uh, in my studies along the way. Um, you ready for another one? Yes, I am ready for another. And I do want to say that Vivek Surti is w still with us. Now, Vivek, as Sun is preparing this next uh, flavor taster for us, I understand that you both are working and collaborating on a new project. Tell us what you're working on. Yeah. Uh, we're doing a fun little collaborative dinner. Um, it's on September, uh, or sorry, October 13th. Uh, and it's going to be at Taylor. Uh, it's on a Sunday. And it's a fundraiser for API Middle Tennessee. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Now, son, you just handed me a spoon with a tiny green, like a pea. So those are actually capered sun, uh, green sun gold tomatoes. Wow. Yeah, these are tomatoes uh, from summer of 23. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're, they're grown at, uh, at Sugar Camp Farms in Ashland City. And uh, I basically treated them like the way you make capers you okay. know, with salt and vinegar. But what's very special about these is they're, they're, used, uh, they're made with a kombucha vinegar. Uh, so it adds like just another little depth of flavor there. Um, and then, yeah, these, they, they basically taste like capers, but they're, they're tomatoes, man. Man, that's something, because when I bit into it, it tasted like a caper, but it was kind of, I don't know if this makes sense to anyone, had a little bit of golden sunshine in the flavor a little bit, <laughs> if that makes sense. It wasn't as, as strong and as touch, but, you know, okay, so talking about this project, this, this pop-up that you all are doing on the 13th, I don't really mean to be cliche, but how were you able to work together yeah. to blend these two different styles of food together without having too many cooks in the kitchen? Yeah. I think, you know, it's like we first started out just, it's always like setting the expectation. And I think sometimes you have collaborative chef dinners where it's like one chef does a course, another chef does a course, you know, another chef does one. And there everybody's just doing their own, their own thing. Uh, but I think the fun part about our collaboration was both of us really wanted to learn about each other's food mm -hmm. and then say, okay, what can we now do together? So I think, you know, one of the first courses that we're going to do is, is I think, a very interesting one because, um, you know, it's, it's basically a, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a miso fermented pumpkin. Wow. And that's kind of where we started, right, with pumpkin that Sun had uh, fermented last, last year. And we thought about, okay, what are the fermenting techniques that we have that we utilize in Gujarat? So the general category for us is called atanu. So atanu is basically a salt pickle that's done with oil and with spices. So then we said, okay, how about we mix the spices that we use in atanu with the miso, and then we cure the pumpkins that way, right? And so we're trying to take, again, those ideas of fermentation with ingredients that are fall, and saying, what is the through line mm. between Vietnamese and Indian culture? Wow. And can we integrate those two things to create something that's completely new? Wow, that's something else. That's amazing. I do have a question for you, but son, you just handed me one more spoonful. What is this? Yes. So this is uh, a Rocky Glade Farms uh, Butterkin Tamari. So mm. the, these are... Whoa. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's insane. Um, so these are butterkin squashes uh, from Rocky Glade Farms in Eagleville, Tennessee, that I turned into a miso. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it, it fermented for about six months. So this is from fall of 23, okay. uh, the butterkins that you're tasting. Um, and this is the this, this liquid that forms on top uh, that kind of separates from the miso. It's basically just a bunch of amino liquids that are part of the fermentation process. Uh, it's called tamari, you know, and that's what you're tasting right now. I loved everything you gave me. Tasted great. This, by far, 
was my favorite. All right, we've got to go, but let me ask just one quick question. What do you think Nashville and the Middle Tennessee scene, food scene, needs more of? I think that, uh, you know, when when I set out uh, from the catbird seat to go run my own concepts, uh, you know, uh, Chef Baxter at Catbird said to me one thing that I'll never forget. He said, don't really focus on having a lot of stuff on your menu. You know, you've got to really dial in your flavors, you know, just like we do here. And it's something that kind of really stuck with me forever, you know. Um, so I think that that's what this town can always, any town could always need, is to have restaurants that just dial in their flavors and don't focus on just having, you know, making sure you have a salad. You mm-hmm. Know? Mm-hmm. Um, but just making sure that you just have great quality food that tastes great. From what you both have shared with me, you have definitely dialed in and honed in on your flavors. I really appreciate you both being here. Sun Pham is the owner of Mr. Sons, and Vivek Surti is the owner of Taylor Nashville. They're joining forces for Mr. Sons and Taylor, a fundraiser for API Middle Tennessee. That's October 13th at 5 p.m. at Taylor, 620 Taylor Street. You can find out more about the event on this episode's web post at thisisnashville.org. Pardon me. Sun Vivek, thank you both. For being with us today, you can expect me to see me at your spot soon. That was delicious. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right. We're going to take one more break. When we come back, we'll talk with a first-generation Mexican-American about her love of food culture and how she brings the two together at her restaurant, Tantissimo. You can join the conversation by tweeting us at This Is Nashville. We'll be right back. Khalil Colonna, and this is Nashville. In today's diverse society, food plays a crucial role in fostering understanding and acceptance. It opens doors to conversations about history, geography, and customs, and allowing people to learn about cultures different from their own while engaging in a delicious, delicious way. Anna Aguilar is a first generation of Mexican descent. She has come here to Nashville from Santa Maria, California. She and her partner, Josh Cook, run Tantissimo, a farm to table restaurant offering small place craft cocktails and experiences celebrating Latin America. Thank you so much for being here, Anna. Welcome to This is Nashville. Thank you so much for okay, having me. Really appreciate it. Okay, we're talking about culture, and I'm curious about your move from California to Tennessee. I lived in California for some years. I know it could be a culture shock. What was your experience like? It was for sure. I moved here almost 13 years ago. So at the time, even very different food scene than there is now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I kind of just, I tried looking at carniceria's and I tried looking for my favorite foods. And it was a struggle to find the quality I was used to and the freshness I was used to in California for Latin American food especially without driving like really far to the outskirts of town. So eventually I just kind of went with Southern food and I got to learning about casseroles and sweet potatoes and I had fun with that for a while. And and then during COVID is when I had the time to kind of open my eyes to how much the city had changed and how much uh, people were receptive to these flavors. And it's been really fun getting to share that. Now, when you were in town driving, looking for carnesadillas, did you look for the ones that had like a grill the smoky grill out front? Um, I mean, I guess I should have. I think I I got scared away from a few places because the, the produce quality was not what I was used to. California is definitely a, a bounty and you find mm-hmm. things without even really looking. Um, so here it was, I mean, I was on my own. I, I moved here uh, without family. So it was just kind of like disheartening. Mm-hmm. And also like the few things that I did find, prices were like, crazy for uh i guess what was considered exotic ingredients and to me it was just like staples of the household so yeah i didn't i didn't fight too hard i kind of just was like i'm in nashville now i also was warned really heavily before moving here that it was not going to be receptive and and luckily that's not been the case but i think i was just kind of overwhelmed and over time i was it's been great to see that the city has has changed and is open to all of this now. During your early years here, did you, uh, it sounded like you had a little bit of a hunger and a thirst for your own, the flavors you were used to growing up. Did you just seek to make those for yourself at home when you could? 
I did. Um, I mean, full disclosure, I'm not a professionally trained chef. So there was definitely a time where I was like a little bit of a Pinterest home cook. Okay. So I was doing that until, uh, you know, until I worked at Husk and I started to be around chefs who were very, very uh, passionate and started to learn a lot more about food and what was available to me here. And then especially when I started dating Josh Cook, who also worked at Husk, um, that was fun because I was like, very close to his experiences, but I was like, Hey, have you ever heard of this? And have you ever heard of that? And he would come eat at my family's house and be exposed to things. And then it's just kind of changed the way that I was thinking about food. Mm. Now you working at Husk, you were working in front of the house, mm -hmm. which is you know, serving tables, seating people and all that. How did you make that transition from the front of the house to the back of the house? Because look, I've worked in restaurant settings and I know how the daily dynamics can go. Mm -hmm. Were you naturally curious about this food and how it was prepared or was it a way for you and Josh to be close to each other? Um, I mean, I was hungry a lot, so that <laughs> helped. Um, I think it was a really nice combination of things. The transition, I made it very awkwardly, but there were some key moments and one of them was uh, Husk has a big thanksgiving kind of potluck family meal every year and um i asked josh what he was making and he didn't know yet and i was like i think i want to make tamales and so he was like i'll make tamales with you and this was before we were dating so i was like okay and that was like the beginning of the exploration of us working together with mexican food and mm. it was great what was that dish that made you feel okay i'm fully a back of the house member i am on fully on my way a path to being a chef I don't uh, I guess the first savory pop-up I did it was because there was more equipment available to me I was uh, at Bar Sovereign and it was the first time that I had more than just my tent and a table and I walked in and was like I think I could do enchiladas here like grandma's enchiladas and maybe from there I could do birria and so I called my dad and that was a really successful pop-up mm -hmm. um, so that was very good for my morale but I think more than any specific dish it was just the grind of doing all those pop-ups many times by m myself um, and and whoever like I had helping me but just doing it day in and day out and figuring like fumbling my way through prep for weeks and weeks and weeks yeah. I think that that's how I felt like I earned it and then eventually I did develop uh, skills you know just from being around uh, Josh and from being on you know, on the table, I guess. <laughs> yeah. You know, a lot of, a lot of listeners are maybe are familiar with Mexican food, but you know, I'm sure like one of our previous guests mentioned the food that people get in the restaurants is not like the food that was prepared at home when you were growing yeah. up. Yeah. What are the major differences? Um, I guess the shortcuts. One, one thing that I think is a really clear example is enchiladas. Uh, that's why that was my first dish that I wanted to present because it was the, the main message I had for people at the time. This is one of my like lifelong favorite dishes and uh, the only dish I got really, really clearly uh, taught to me by my grandma before she passed. And so um, the difference, the main difference is usually if you purchase enchiladas at a restaurant, you're going to get enchiladas that come out of like a baked pan they have like melted cheese um mm -hmm. probably canned sauce mm -hmm. and they can be really delicious but they're not even in the same realm of the product that we serve and the reason is because we fry each enchilada to order and i very quickly learned why restaurants don't do this it's because it's really hard to keep the quality high um especially if you have to plate multiple entrees in this way so what we do now is one singular small plate enchilada and you fry it, you roll it, and you serve it immediately so that the texture doesn't deteriorate, um, which is how grandma would have done it at home. She was, you know, she wasn't dropping four plates of three enchiladas all at once. She yeah. was like, here, grab one. And then an another plate came up to her and she just kind of stood there and cranked them out. So we've had to figure out how to do that. But it's not restaurant friendly, but it's worth it. Mm. Now, you brought some stuff for us to taste. What did you bring? I brought empanadas. Um, these I just baked, but they're still delicious. This is how I R&D'd them originally. Um, you definitely can and should fry them. We like to fry a lot of stuff in lard, but these are vegetarian, actually. Okay. Um, they've got ají amarillo, beans, Parmesan cheese in there, so kind of some Peruvian flavors. And then the dip is a um, mojo verde. It's also called a mojito isleño, um, Caribbean kind of mm. dip. 
Mm, mm, mm. Keep talking, I'm chewing. <laughs> so that, I know, I'm like just watching you for some reason. <laughs> um, this is not Mexican food, but it's one of my favorite things about doing Latin American food in Nashville is Nashville is the place where I learned about broader Latin America because my hometown is, is very heavily Mexican. And it was, uh, I worked at a Puerto Rican restaurant before I worked at Husk. And uh, it's been really fun seeing how much there is to offer. Your partner, Josh, is from Nashville. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about how you blend the flavors together, the flavors that you bring from your upbringing and culture and what he brings from Southern culture into the foods that you all create together. Um, He brings, I mean, the way I look at it and why I was like, please come help me is uh, he brings like unlimited skill and technique and curiosity. So he helps me. Whenever, like if I'm developing a recipe without him, which is rare because he takes the lead for the most part now, then I still, uh, you know, bounce things off of him and and he helps with that. Um, He's really well connected with the farms here in town. He's really uh, the reason that I kind of learned to care so much about supporting local. And um, I think he was very helpful in, in my journey to understanding food and the whole ecosystem, if you will. It's really unique because here's a path you found yourself on, mm-hmm. and yet you feel quite comfortable with it. Do you think about grandma and family well, while you're at work doing your thing? Yeah, I think about her especially on the extremely long, long, long days uh, because I think she had a day like that every single day. Mm. Um, I, I came into restaurants very ignorantly, um, so I was very confused about chef culture and why there weren't like a lot of women in the kitchen of like why it was a male dominated field. I'm like, I don't understand. Like grandma was cooking all the time. So like, why aren't we back here? Um, so yeah, I think about her and her, uh, endless work ethic on those days that it's hard to keep going. Yeah. Or if I don't feel like cleaning something, I'm like, grandma would have cleaned it. She would not have left it there. <laughs> she would have looked, She would have kept it going. Mm-hmm. Uh, have your family members tried anything that you and Josh have been creating? They have, yeah. That first savory pop-up I did, I had my whole family out there. Um, a couple of my aunts said that things were a little too salty, but I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. hard to get it perfect for family. But for me, that was like a standing ovation. Because, okay. uh, yeah, family is very, very critical all the yeah. time. I, I tend to share most of our dishes with uh, one of my cousins who has really high standards. And uh, Paloma, you always tell us how it is. Uh-huh. She can let you know yeah, what's good Yeah, she'll be like, um, this could use a little more. <laughs> Josh always likes to laugh about the time that she said, I don't know. I just feel like it could be better. And we're like, what? <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> more salt, more pepper. Yeah. You, now, you both are in the middle of a transition. You're moving from a pop-up to a permanent location. How is that process going for you? It's going good. I understand now why everything's always, uh, you know, taking longer than you think it will. And uh, it's been great for me just learning, I guess, more about how everything works. Um, I'm thinking we're going to break ground this week or next, and that's like a huge milestone for me. Well, congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah. And you also have a pop-up coming up on the 6th. We do. Tell us about that. Yeah. So we were hoping to be open um, much sooner, but it, it's looking like January now. So we were like, well, we can't wait. We want to put food out to the neighborhood. And so we're doing a pop-up on the patio um, of the actual restaurant. So um, nothing, you know, it'll just be street food, but we'll be presenting some of the dishes that we did when we were in the Henry James kitchen, which is like aguachiles. Um, we'll have a steak and chimichurri. We'll have uh, we'll have tacos because people know us for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I'll, I'll be releasing the rest of the menu today on Instagram. But I'm really excited to introduce ourselves to the neighborhood there. Tell me this: the essence that is Nashville, the essence that is Nashville's growing and changing food culture. How do you want to imprint it? <laughs> One of my favorite things from working at Husk was just helping to, like as a server, was helping a a guest to feel more comfortable exploring food they weren't familiar with. Um, And that is exactly what I hope to do on our menu. There's there's a lot of things on there that are really user-friendly, like, you know, tacos. But there's going to be some things that maybe a person hasn't experienced before. So I just want people to let us take them on a journey that we're also on because we're also always learning about, you know, different regions of Mexico, different countries, different ways of preparing dishes. 
and just kind of open that global experience for people. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for being here. Congratulations on the new pop-up. And thank you for bringing these delicious empanadas. I'm going to share them with the team because they're yelling at me. They're waving at me, actually, through the glass. I'm going to make sure that happens. Anna Aguilar is the co-owner of Tantissimo. You can get more information on the special pop-up they're holding on October 6th on this episode's web post at thisisnashville.org. Anna, thank you again for being here. Muchas gracias. Yes. Okay. Thanks to you for tuning in this hour. This is Nashville is a production of Nashville Public Radio. Today, Today's episode was produced by David Hooper. It was directed by Tasha A.F. Lemley. Our technical director and board operator is Liv Lombardi. The masterminds behind our theme music are LaRange and Namir Blade. Listen back at thisisnashville.org or wherever you get good podcasts. And the conversation never ends here. You can tweet us at This Is Nashville, find us on Instagram, and tell us what you want from our show by filling out our quick survey online. You can also call to leave us a message, 615-751-2500. We may use your message on air, and I can guarantee you all this food they brought will be gone by the time you call. This is Nashville. I'm Khalil Ekelona. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody. And be good to each other.